Am I good? Hey everyone, my name is Holly Walker and I live in Squamish, British Columbia. I'm an apprentice ski guide with the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides and I'm a professional member of the Association, sorry, of Canadian Avalanche Association. I'm going to switch over now to a PowerPoint presentation, so stand by while I juggle. Okay, the talk this evening is identifying avalanche terrain using fat maps. This talk is not an avalanche course. I highly recommend that everyone signs up for an avalanche course in the field and in the region you plan on traveling. Refresh the skill set as often and at the beginning of every winter. I know I do. Continue to practice these skills often and with fellow backcountry partners so you'll be all on the same page. My goal tonight is to present to you the FATMAP Explore product. This is just one more tool to add to that growing toolbox. I hope it helps increase your awareness of the hazards and the exposure in avalanche terrain. It's rare to see someone in the backcountry without a transceiver, shovel, probe, and partner. But what about a good route plan and a map? Or a GPS-based GPS product like FATMAP? Here is a QR code for you for your 30-day FATMAP Explore trial. Avalanche accidents occur when three things come together. Avalanche terrain, avalanche conditions, and backcountry travelers. Avalanche Canada defines a list of factors that are the most important for determining the severity of avalanche terrain. Remember, when we can't control the snowpack, we can choose the terrain carefully and our exposure within it. We are going to review the list of avalanche terrain factors tonight and try to look at each within FATMAP. Disclaimer though, your route planning should be done from the comfort of your home. And once in the field, nothing will beat the power of ground truth, using your own eyes in the real world. Factors of avalanche terrain. I'm going to read through this list because I'll be discussing it again. Slope angle, exposure from above, slope size, slope shape, orientation to wind, orientation to sun, terrain roughness, terrain traps, and forest cover. Now I'm going to go and zoom over to fat maps. Stand by. Okay, so let's go ahead, everyone. If you're on a computer, log yourself in to fatmap.com and pick a zone we may want to ski. Myself, I want to scope Decker Mountain. It's a glaciated peak here in the Spearhead Range, accessed from Blackcomb Mountain. Myself, I ski a lot at Whistler Blackcomb. Let's zoom in. and have a look at the terrain. I know it has some awesome steep skiing, especially on the north facing side. So I'm gonna rotate my compass dial around. And let's zoom back out a little bit. Okay. First on our list was slope angle. Slope angle in the start zone is one of the most important factors affecting the likelihood of avalanches. On fat map, we are going to access terrain layer, which is down here in this corner. And there's an overlays button. From here, we're gonna click on avalanche, this one right here. And we can now see there's a lot of avalanche terrain out there. The avalanche layer does not incorporate magnitude or frequency of avalanches. It represents only the average start zone angle. As you can see, it lists from 25 over here to 45 degrees plus over here. Slab avalanches affect people 
are initiated on slopes between 30 to 45 degrees, whereas 25 to 30 degrees represents infrequent, often large slab avalanches or loose wet avalanches. Remember, this is the angle of the start zone and between 30 to 45 degrees are the most common angles of an avalanche. It's like riding a black diamond ski run. Next on our list was exposure from above. Flat or moderate terrain that is less than 25 degrees may not produce avalanches, yet this is still to be considered avalanche terrain, especially if it is threatened by a slide from above or it's in the track or runout zone. Good route planning with travel on lower angled terrain and minimizing exposure to steep slopes above are effective ways to limit our overall exposure to avalanche terrain. Let's look here again at Decker. I'm gonna zoom back in. Not that close, sorry. Okay. Let's check out this run here called Ninth Hole. Just gonna take this avalanche layer off real quick to make it easier for everyone to see. So here's ninth hole right there. There's a chute that comes off of ninth hole right down through here. Historically, this terrain here is a natural producer of avalanches. And if we switch back to that avalanche button, we just had up pulled up. We will see 30 to 45 degree terrain and right over the heads of people that traverse this regularly established up track. So if you can all see right here, there's actually a pretty well-defined track that gets put in by people. And there's definitely 40, 30 to 40 degree slope right above my head there. Let's look at Decker more closely. Uh, do, do, do. Okay, this ascent travels up under that steep slope, which is right here I was saying, and continues to climb up the Decker Glacier. So again, I'm gonna turn this off. So here's Decker Glacier. I recommend knowing where not to stop and when to spread out, so you're not all exposed at the same time. Cornices can be a hazard as well, Typically, there's cornices all along the ridge line up here. They can start an avalanche from above, and if the cornice itself falls, it can in some cases be as big as a school bus, which could kill or injure you. More so, I'd recommend you take a wide berth when climbing this slope, or don't climb it at all. If the avalanche conditions and cornices aren't right, there are other ways to access the summit of Decker. Also, if we switch back over to this button here called Summer, we can now have a look more closely at the imagery and see where the glaciated terrain is, where all the crevasses are. This allows you to get an idea of those other hazards like crevasses, like I said, as well as early season rocks. Another category in avalanche terrain is slope size. So I'm just gonna go here. This is important in addressing the severity of avalanche terrain. No special button is needed. I can see the size of the slope. That being said, you can always pull up an elevation button to help. So right here, I can now see, if I'm gonna ski this ninth hole run, it goes from 2,020 meters all the way down to 2,120. So that is over 300 meters plus. In InfoX, which is an 
data exchange for snow professionals and in the public avalanche min report that came out in January last year, there was a size three avalanche that was three meters deep and ran the full length of 300 meters plus. Even though here in fat maps, the data and the image that we're looking at is from 2019, if anyone was curious when these images were last taken, we can actually still see there's some old avalanche debris down here. So 2019, avalanche occurred there, 2020, 2021, it's a pretty regular spot. So teachable moment. The slope size will dictate the size of an avalanche. And this is coupled with the snow height. So the longer the slope length and the deeper the snow pack means the bigger the avalanche could be. And it depends on your avalanche problem. Greater space in your group will lessen your group's exposure. All right, next on our list to discuss is slope shape. Slope shape. It's always better in real life, but Fat Maps features both 3D and contours, which gives you an impression of slope shapes. Let's click here, go back to those layers on the base map, and I'm then going to select Global Topo, and I want to switch over to 2D. Old school, let's look at the map. Okay, so I can now see the contours are 10 meters apart, and using these contours, I can predict ridge lines and gullies. Over here on Mount Patterson, I can see a pretty long ridge line, and the tighter contours, as you can see right here and here, reflect steeper slopes. But of course, nothing replaces on-site terrain and sensible judgment in the real world when making our travel decisions. Just out of curiosity, I now want to go back and have a look at how steep that was according to, yeah, that's pretty steep right in there. Okay. Okay, next on the list was orientation to the wind. Under moderate to strong winds, new falling snow and or loose surface snow tends to be moved from windward slopes onto lee slopes. A windward slope is a slope that faces into the wind. A lee slope represents downwind slope. When this happens, lee slopes becomes loaded with a wind slab deposit. For me, the first thing in the morning when I'm still in my PJs drinking my coffee, I can read the Avalanche forecast on Avalanche Canada's website for the Sea to Sky region. So here I'm going to flip over to the Avalanche forecast. Pulling up March 16th of 2021. Here it says, it is possible that riders could trigger wind slabs in steep terrain. Reading the danger ratings... It says two moderate in the alpine, two moderate in the treeline, and one below treeline. Today in this example, we are playing to climb and ski Decker like we talked about, and it's in the alpine. As I dig deeper into these problems, and click over there, for the sea to sky, under wind slab, it says, riders could still trigger wind slabs from recent snow and extreme southeast wind. There's been reports of large avalanches triggered by riders and cornices in the past week. So use particular caution in committing terrain with high consequences. So switching back to fat maps and that train that we want to go check out. So I'm going to take this global topo off. I'm going to clear all the layers to start fresh again. And we were talking about Decker here, so I'll zoom back in. I 
I can click again now. Let's go back onto the aspect button. And I see the line I want to climb is north, northwest. And the best ski descent options are here on the north face or due west facing, which is over here. This run right here is called Decker, Maine. So if the wind was blowing from the southeast, it is potentially loaded on both the north and west facing slopes. I can then read further into that avalanche forecast report I was reading about the details. It says small to large size one to 2.5 slabs were triggered by skiers, explosives and naturally on Monday with recent 10 to 20 centimeters of storm slow. And it has, and it said the cornices are now big and they could fall and release large chunks that could potentially kill a person. So that gets me thinking to myself, you know, if those wind slabs and now cornices up on the top here near the summit is part of my root plan, maybe this is now beyond my risk tolerance. As I finish my morning cup of coffee by using the weather forecast, the avalanche forecast, combined with fat maps, I can decide to change my plan altogether before leaving the house. Maybe I'll just make a more conservative plan for the musical bumps on Whistler. Okay, next on our list in the avalanche terrain factors was orientation to the sun. Excuse me while I sip my water real quick. So my home here in Squamish, BC is in the Northern Hemisphere and the sun has the greatest effect on south facing slopes. These slopes are called solar aspects. Here they are in the red. Zoom back out again. On days with sunshine or high thin cloud cover, the sun's rays warm and weaken the snow surface. This creates rapid settlement, which can trigger a weak layer and create an avalanche. It's not uncommon to see avalanche activity on solar aspects on the first sunny day after a storm or during a weak spring day, or sorry, during a warm spring day. Also, because the sun rises in the east, it also affects east-facing slopes in the morning and west facing slopes later in the afternoon. Again, we can turn on these aspects like we've done to see which slopes are north, east, south, and west. It's all nicely color coded. Okay, so next I wanna do an exercise. So I'm gonna take all my layers off and start fresh again. Let's come back to our original spot we were talking about. Okay. I want to create a track now. My plan is to ascend the north side of Decker. There's, like I already stated, there's already, I don't know if you can, anyone can see, I see tiny little people there in this photo. Um, there's already a track there, so why don't I retrace that track? It's already been created in real life. So right down at the bottom here, I can create a new route. And today we are ski touring. I could upload a GPS track if I'm already super happy with it or I know the area well and I've already skied it before, maybe recorded it on my watch. But instead I'm going to draw a route tonight. The first thing I'll do is pick a starting point so I can traverse to about here and I'm gonna transition, put my skins on and start climbing up. I can go all the way across here and start my zigzag. 
There's a, that old track I was saying I can try to connect with, take advantage of these people. Okay, so just back and forth. Don't want it to be too steep. There's a crevasse I see there, so I'm just gonna jog around it. There's a button here. I can recenter my route. Very nice. I'm gonna switch back one more time and get up onto this ridge. Okay, so how steep was this terrain that was above me on the right? Before I save this track, I just want to show to everyone, I don't know if you can see way down here on my bottom left, it shows me my scent time it would take me about an hour to two hours. It's 2.2 kilometers. I'm not good at math. It shows my elevation change. That's 334 meters. So I'm now going to go and save this. I'm going to call this a maybe for now because, well, we haven't discussed and come to the conclusion that we want it to be live to everyone yet. Let's call it difficult. I know there's a lot of crevasses I'm traveling through. And I'm going to save it privately for now. So if I zoom back in, my questions were, how steep was that terrain on the right-hand side? I can go back like we did before and click that avalanche button. It's like, whew, okay. I, I have some pretty big avalanche slopes right above my head to the right. We already talked about seeing some avalanche debris way over here, but there's some over here as well. Um, this slope is also highly glaciated. Curious if my track goes through any of those crevasses. It's like, okay, I, I jogged a couple, but I also went through. So there's also big overhanging corses, cornices on the top here. And my track is exposed to so many things. I have avalanche hazard on one side, crevasses below my feet, cornices over my head. So maybe my risk tolerance is too low to select this as my up track. Um, what other ways could we go up Decker to avoid hazards is my, my big question here. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this track. I'm not happy with it. Not today. So to get fresh again, all right, where else could we go? I want to still summit Decker. Luckily for all of you to save us a bunch of time, I've already created another up track. So this up track here is used regularly once the rocks are filled in. I'm sure you saw in the summer version. The slope is quite rocky, the terrain but there's no crevasse hazard there. And it's a smaller avalanche slope. I can use it to continue onwards if I still wanna summit Decker like we were talking about, or if I wanna go over the backside and head on up Patterson or go beyond and continue around on my spearhead traverse if I have a big day ahead of me. So, like I said, I'm happy with this track. I'm now going to make it live. To do that, I need to go in and edit it. And we're going to publish it on Fat Maps. We'll see if it works. See if you can pick it up on your end. Sure, it's awesome. You tell me what you think afterwards. Okay. Next on our list, terrain roughness. So
So let's go back, start fresh again. I'm not going to spend too much time discussing this factor as the best way to learn terrain that is hiding under our skis is to go and hike the area in the summertime. Plus, the snowpack depth is going to have variable results on the stability. For example, forests have high roughness where alpine areas have less. If you pick a piece of terrain that is logged, I'm going to jump over here. This is Wedgemont area, or Wedge area, I think the neighborhood's called. It's a piece of terrain that's logged with high stumps and logs are left over on the ground. This would cause the area to have a high surface roughness. You'd meet, you would need more snow to cover up all these features and to start producing a weak layer. In comparison, alpine features with bedrock and heather would only need a little bit of snow to cover it all up. Though the images here on fat maps, as you can see, are very recent, changes in the terrain are always occurring. Know where, where places are being logged, where, um, yeah, there's just changes all the time. Okay. Next, I'm gonna jump around, sorry. There we go. Okay, next is terrain traps. Terrain traps are features that increase the risk of physical injury. They include trees, rocks, cliffs, and open water. Train traps increase burial depth. Train traps that increase burial depth also include gullies, benches, and crevasses. Be sure to include the effect of train traps in the assessment of your potential route plan. Remember, when we looked at the avalanche button, again, this represents areas where avalanche start. This should not be confused with where they can be triggered from and where they can reach. It is possible to remote trigger an avalanche and it can then reach terrain that is less than 30 degrees. So always be aware of the terrain that's above you and the train traps that are below you, like gullies or depressions. So quick side story for everyone. I used to be a ski patroller for Whistler Blackcomb and we were doing avalanche control one day. So lots of explosives. And I'm zooming in on the area. We were doing control work on Blackcomb. You can see tons of avalanche slide paths. But we, we were able to get avalanches to occur on the poop shoots and on the spanky side, so to speak, in gray zone. So in this massive coli feature, we had so much avalanche debris, it took days for the snowcats to clear the area, to reopen the train um, to the general public, to the Whistler Blackcomb riders again. So just be aware when you're crossing through, even though Right here, I'm not in avalanche terrain. There's definitely huge potential what's over your head. All right, let's zoom back out here. Next, I want to talk about the Whistler Mountain. I don't want, don't want it to be forgotten. So here we go. We're now over on the Whistler side. Zooming out, just to give people perspective, this was the Blackcomb side here. Here's the Fitzsimmons Creek. And here's Whistler Mountain. And the chairlift here underneath my arrow, this is Symphony Chair. So the last category in our avalanche terrain assessment, we're going to talk about forest cover. And now we're on what's called the musical bumps. Nope, wrong, wrong way. Apologies. Stand by. 
before I mess with my buttons here. Back to Whistler. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. Here we are. Okay. So Whistler Mountain. We're going to scroll over from our starting point. So most of you, I'm sure, have whist uh, visited Whistler before and have probably ski toured down Flute to Oboe Creek. It's a zone called Flute Cruiser. And what I do is I put on my skins here, I ski tour up Flute. I'm exiting the ski area boundary where Avalanche Control was doing, uh, sorry, Ski Patrol was doing Avalanche Control, everything on the flute side, but now I'm out of bounds. So this run right over here, this is called Flute Cruiser that I was mentioning. In the case of forest cover, if the stands of trees are sufficiently dense, they provide a certain amount of anchoring to the snowpack, and this will reduce the likelihood of avalanches. Provided that you are capable of moving safely between trees, travel in densely forested terrain can be a good choice during periods of elevated avalanche danger. A good rule of thumb is that if the canopies of the trees are touching each other, you're in sufficiently dense forest to provide good protection. Let's real quick go back to the decision-making that we were talking about at the beginning of this presentation. If we're uncertain about the avalanche conditions, let's choose terrain wisely. Whistler backcountry is super popular and it's easy to get pulled into the heuristic traps of familiarity, social proof, commitment, and scarcity. Example, I'm thinking, okay, there's an uptrack already. It's crossing a big steep slope. I'll just get through there quickly. Or maybe my partner hasn't waited long enough for me to finish transitioning, putting my jacket back on. I'm struggling to keep up. I simply, I just follow along. So my question, if it were you, how much time would you plan to ski tour up through this area? Or could you have picked a less hazardous place like the trees to climb? So with Tam, Cam McTavish here, this nice up track that he's put in. Let, let's have a look at it. So I'm going to down here at Oboe Creek. Let's see what the elevation is. Okay, it's at 1630. I'm going to transition and start climbing up. Now, these tracks that are created by other people, they're awesome suggestions, but let's not follow them too confidently or blindly altogether. Let's use our own eyes so I can see I don't actually need to enter into this big open spot. I can just do a couple switchbacks here through the trees, and I'm staying in the trees the whole time. I really like how Tam has kept us on this bench here and has us climbing up, continuing in the trees and getting us up over onto the ridge and avoiding any other hazards, potential slopes over our heads. So reminder to everyone, even to myself, let's all be good partners this season and open up our communication between the group. Let's make good choices that we have studied and root planned at home for. I know no one plans to make a bad decision once they're in the field, but it happens and we usually get away with it. I was talking to a friend last night. They were saying I was really busy all week. I didn't have a chance to make my plan, my ski tour outline for the weekend. I just went along. So 
you know, just be aware you're, you're entering into to big terrain. There are three other terrain buttons that I find super useful. And I'm going to go back here to clean off my slate. All right. So these train buttons, let's go back to Whistler though. Haven't spent enough time over here. So three other buttons, super useful. I know I've already mentioned it, but another reasoning for this elevation button, what if I were to check the weather forecast in the morning and it tells me it's gonna be raining up to 2000 meters today. I can quickly do an elevation check and see, wow, okay, everything in the musical bumps is going to be wet. Second, I can go to the flats tool right here. And let's zoom in again. So the flats tool shows everything in green and it represents zero gradient. This tool is particularly useful for finding camping spots or avoiding flat runout zones. Snowboarders will enjoy this. When determining my camping spots though, I also look at the gradient tool because, well, what's over my head? So, you know, here's a nice flat spot. But wow, this is this is steep terrain right here off of flute. And I, I know it I know what avalanche is. So the gradient tool is also amazing to help me be aware of those overhead hazards. Um, last features I want to show you all is the live snow layers. There's depth fresh snow, and forecast. Currently, and sadly, these layers are not available yet in Canada. Thank you, Fat Maps. I know you're constantly developing the product. Um, these layers, though, may be in your region in the US and in Europe. So I will leave you all with some homework to do your own research to see if it applies to where you are living. I'm now gonna switch back to my slideshow. Wrong button, fast forward, okay. Severity of avalanche terrain. The severity increases if multiple factors apply. For example, a large steep slope with convex features and terrain traps such as cliffs and gullies is more severe than a large slope with a good run out that is more uniform in nature. Thank you, Avalanche Canada skills book. So I hope everyone continues to keep exploring a little bit more on their computer and smartphone and with their new Fat Map Explore membership. Again, Fat Map though, is a simple trip planning tool that can help us make decisions in avalanche terrain. Yet FatMap is just one insight about the terrain to make your backcountry travel choices. It's just one more tool for that growing toolbox. Please practice with your friends, take more avalanche courses, travel safely. Uh, here again is the Explore Fat Map code if anyone wants access to it. We'll also have it in the chat for you. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to some questions and answers. If I don't know the answer, I apologize. I'll have to get back to you on it. But I want to give, before I forget, special thanks to Avalanche Canada. Their information helped me with this presentation and I will continue to use their avalanche forecasts regularly throughout the winter and into the spring and continue to study throughout the summertime. Please be sure to check out Avalanche Canada 
even if it doesn't apply to your zone, you live in the States, there's tons of resources on it. Lots of just free education. So thank you once again. And I'm just going to switch screens here. And am I back on, Nora? If anyone has any questions. Who's been skiing already this season? That's my question for you all. If I have any one answer that. It snowed already here on the coast, up in Whistler but only up high. So myself, I haven't gone. I'm too afraid of the sharks, the rocks. I have some friends that have gone and said it was quite nice. All right, we have a question. Have I ever been in a close call situation? Um, unfortunately, that is a yes. I've been in two different avalanche accidents. One was myself. I was in Switzerland and I traversed a slope and a little back history there. There was avalanche warning that day that conditions were high and or the avalanche risk was a high. And I was with a professional photographer and we were skiing shoots just off the tram, which was in the back country and the powder was awesome i i was you know the social pressure powder fiend whatever you call it the kodak moment i just i was i was drawn in and the powder was phenomenal and we skied another lap and another lap and another lap and um, i went then to traverse over the slope to get to another feature we were going to get the photo get the shot and i hate to admit it I wasn't thinking, like I said, I got suckered and I, I wanted that cover of that magazine. So as I traversed across, I heard a whoomp and a crack crack and the whole slope hit me from above and I was taken downhill from there. So um, super lucky. I was not buried. I ended up blowing my knee because my ski didn't release. And uh, my other story was a friend was fully buried in an avalanche. And we dug him out fast. I was super lucky in the end. Um, he fully recovered. So I get choked up talking about that because it was a super close call. Um, next question. Do you use any other tools like Gaia as a complement to FatMap? Are there capabilities that you feel FatMap is missing? Um, so great question. I come from a history of using Gaia. I actually, you know, don't have the old school navigation of map and compass. I've, I've learned it backwards. So I learned Gaia first, super happy with it. It's a phenomenal product. That being said, now that fat maps has come out, I can take all those layers like I was just showing you and take that two dimensional map, which you're using in Gaia, and now you're able to turn it into three dimensional and you're looking at the actual topography of the steep slope of the terrain features. And so when I'm at home, I used to be able to go on and look at Google Earth and then jump over to Gaia and compare it and upload a track onto Google Earth and then transfer that same track over to Gaia and then back and forth, back and forth and correct, correct until I was happy with that final track product. And I think it's pretty amazing now that Gaia is combining, not Gaia, sorry, FatMap is combining the two products of what the Gaia has and what the Google Earth has. So um, yeah, I, I don't know, I don't have a hard answer as far as what it's missing, but it's a great combination of the two products. 
Um, thoughts on Avalungs versus Avalanche airbags? I'm just going to read this question out so I don't miss. I get the perspective on the cost of a life, but I'm also wondering if people have given up on the Avalung or if people are using a combination of both. Personally, I don't use an Avalung. Um, it's really difficult, I can tell you, me being in that avalanche. Um, you know, you talk about what you're supposed to do in an avalanche and you're supposed to throw your ski poles away and you're supposed to start swimming to stay above, but but I froze. I, I, I didn't know what to do, even though I've trained again and again and again. And with the avalanche, you've got it right here and you need to think, I gotta stick it right in my mouth and I gotta start breathing through it. Where um, for myself, avalanche airbags, it's a quick trigger. It's pulled and boom, I'm floating to the top where I can't guarantee that I'm gonna keep that avalanche in my mouth. So that's my own personal opinion. Is there any differences between the avalanche filter and the gradient filter apart from the avalanche filter having a smaller range? Um, great question. We can get a more solid answer for you. I can tell just looking at the two that the, the pixels, the raw data of the gradient filter, it it, it looked like it wasn't as specific. Um, so, you know, I, I like using both. The The avalanche filter shows me where, where the avalanche start zone is, but the gradient filter will show me where that avalanche could potentially reach if I'm looking at 20 to 10, you know, I'm looking beyond it. It's, it shows the whole 100% scale, so. Uh, do I have a beacon preference? Um, my hard answer on that, I've been using it for 15 years now, is the Mamut beacon um, transceiver. That being said, the Mamut Berryvox S right now, it has the biggest range on the market, so 70 meters. It's super fast and super efficient. People tell me, oh, 70 meters and professionals use it. That must be complicated. I find it pretty foolproof. I have a big screen and it'll show me to zig back and forth for a signal search. I'll, I'll pick up a signal. It'll then point an arrow. The numbers will decrease. I'll suddenly get into my close range. And within 10 meters, you know, I'm taking my skis off. Within five years, I'm pulling out my probe or my partner's passing it to me and it actually shows me a little person and it shows me when it's time to start probing when I'm a meter or less. So um, I find it very fast, very efficient and time is of the essence. You know, we have 15 minutes to get an 80% survival rate on someone for, for their breathing if they're dying of this asphyxiation. So I want a transceiver or beacon that I know works super, super fast and super efficiently and uh, is super simple to use at the same time. So uh, working ski patrol, I had the newest Berryvox S and everyone had the Pulse. And the Pulse is awesome too. It's just the Berryvox S is that much newer. And I, I was able to find the, the pretend person in a third of the time. So just hate to promote people buying new products all the time, but I feel like you should replace your transceiver with the best product on the market based on the fact that your life depends on it. Next question is, without using your phone in the back country, what's a way to plan on your computer and apply the intended route when in the back country? How do you remember your intended uptrack line preferences? Um, good question. I personally do use my phone in the back country. 
I turn it on in airplane mode. I keep it away from my transceiver. I want at least 30 centimeters distance, 50 centimeters or more if I'm searching. Um, so I'll either keep it in my pant pocket or keep it in my backpack. And I won't pull it out all the time because if I've planned on my computer, I've looked at, you know, old school maps and I've, you know, in your off season, especially, you can make a lot of route plans and figure out that terrain. The better you remember it, if you end up in a full whiteout and you have no idea what you're looking at, well, sorry, I'm returning back to pulling my cell phone out. Um, I could be using a compass and using a bearing if I've made a proper whiteout plan, but I can also just pull my track out and see if I'm moving on it. So don't know if that answered your question. Do you think that people have different perceptions of slope angle as a competent of, oh, as competent of propensity when on the computer versus actually looking at a slope? So I think the question is, how do you know if something is what angle? Um, there's different tools out there. There's inclinometers that you could travel with you and you literally just put it on the slope and you can see the angle that it is. Some people's ski poles have that on it. Um, I, I can a lot of times base it on the feel under my feet. That being said, I. I know 10 to 15 degrees because that's where I like to put in an up track. I can usually tell quite easily when it's 20 degrees, but unless it's 30 degrees, I find it pretty boring to ski. And when it becomes 40 degrees, that's when I really enjoy it. So yeah, I, I don't have the best answer for you, but lots of, lots of training, go ski. Uh, two more questions. Which sea to sky low consequence areas, aside from red heather or musical bumps, would you recommend novices to get in? That's a good question. Um, let's hold on to that one because I, I could send you a whole list of, of different zones. You've already called it out. Red heather hut area is amazing. Musical bumps, people think it's low consequence but it actually still has quite a few avalanche slopes in that area so I'd, I'd be hesitant of that if you're if you're trying to avoid avalanche danger altogether um but yeah i'll get we'll get the email of that person and i'll write you a response final question okay at what point should someone complete an ast2 course i've been told you should have a certain amount of experience before doing so. What are your thoughts? I actually get this question a lot. Um, there's lots of different answers. My personal take is how confident of a skier are you? And have you already taken your avalanche one? And are you, are you happy with that knowledge already? So meaning, you know, I've already feel comfortable skiing black diamond ski runs in the resort so I can travel through the terrain, whether it's powder or breakable crust or frozen ice or chunder or whatever you want to call it. I, I want to be confident moving through terrain and I want to be confident with my ability to do companion rescue well and understanding um, Avalanches, I want to be have read my avalanche book, which you get from Avalanche Canada. AST2 is perfect for as soon as you're ready to venture a little bit further and you want to discover new terrain and learning how to travel through that terrain well. Um, the biggest point of the Avalanche Skills Training Level 2 course is teaching people um, very good competency of travel within avalanche terrain. AST1 teaches you not to go into avalanche terrain and AST2 teaches you to go into avalanche terrain, but how to do it in the safest manner 
possible if that yeah hopefully that helps you with your your question um and like i said if there's any other outstanding questions or deep thoughts tonight feel free send me an email i probably don't know the answer i'm gonna look it up if i do know the answer i'll answer it quicker um so yeah thanks for everyone for coming out tonight and enjoying hopefully the fat map talk about avalanche terrain but like i said don't treat this as anything but a conversation i promote avalanche courses education and practice as much as you can in the field with your partners so thanks again have a good night everyone and have a great season.